Hey, man. Hey, Mr. Kruger. How you doing, Eddie? I'm good. How are you? Good, thanks. How'd the house hunting go? It is not something I recommend. I think you should just find one place and just buy the first place you see. Don't even... Why? Don't even look at multiple places. It just becomes too much of a headache. How many have you looked at? I've looked at 15. Okay. So far. I feel like, I feel like from what I've been told, like 10 to 15 is the number you want to kind of look at. Yeah. It, it gets overwhelming because there are so many different factors to consider. And your, your, I guess your priorities kind of shift. Every, every new place you see, the size of the bedroom doesn't matter as much because oh, it's such a nice balcony. And then you have another place, oh, the balcony is tiny and the bedroom is huge. This is amazing. And so got to kind of figure out what matters, which is the hardest part, I think. So you haven't, you haven't picked one yet? Not yet. Good luck. How about you? Where are you in your, your hunt? Uh, not, not yet. Um, right now, uh, like the apartment I'm living in with my girlfriend, we moved here at the beginning of the year. It used to be my, my grandpa's apartment. And then he recently moved into a retirement home and he said we could just live here and, and cover like the costs of um, maintenance and stuff like that. So it's super cheap. So we're going to do that for a little bit longer and then maybe in like a year or so. We'll That's a wicked deal. I don't even know why, why you would move. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think my sister is going to move in here when she's done school in like a year. So we're going to, we're going to swap. Um, but yeah, we're gonna we're gonna take advantage of this as long as we can. You're a nice brother. Huh? Not not every I said you're a nice brother. Not every <laughs> sibling would move out so that <laughs> their sibling could get uh, a pretty inexpensive place to live on their own. I mean, it's only fair. Either that, or my mom's just gonna give me a lot of shit. <laughs> why not? Why not both? <laughs> Anyways, um, are you good to jump in? Yeah, let's do it. Cool, cool. Um, actually, first I want to say. I hope you don't mind. I did. I did a little bit of stalking. I saw you. Uh, <laughs> you uh, started your own podcast with work. I did. That's I did. cool. That's cool. I, yeah. I I listened into one of them uh, just because I was curious, and I thought it'd be maybe like a cool concept for me to do with my work. Like, how's how's it going? Have people been tuning in? Yeah. So I've only I've only recorded three episodes so far. Yeah. But there seems to be <clears throat> pretty decent interest from the people I work with. My strategy for getting kind of a higher viewership is I'm trying to cover as many teams as possible as quickly as possible. So one person per team before I go back to anyone else on that same team. Just so everyone kind of has skin in the game. Cool. But yeah, I recommend it. It's also, it's just like from a more of a selfish perspective for you. It's a great way to actually get to know people. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Maybe uh, transition a little bit into the, the topic of, uh, of goal setting, which we're going to talk about. Did you, so you mentioned kind of one goal is, is talk to someone in each kind of department. Do you, did you set other, other goals for the podcast in terms of you want to do like an episode a week or a certain number of episodes or a number of people you want to listen to it? Yeah. Uh, so, my goal for the frequency with which I produce podcasts is once a week, yeah. per, one, one episode per week. Yeah. I think that's a good cadence for now. Really just depends on, on, on your work schedule. So sometimes I get to Wednesday and I go, goodness, <laughs> got to, got to rec write, record, um, and then add the music for the, the podcast. I don't know. Do you, how, how frequently do you put episodes out? I've, I've been doing once a week too. It feels like a yeah, a nice rhythm. Uh, more than that, I feel like it, it's it's a lot. One, once a week has been manageable and and nice. Mm -hmm. And do yeah. you? How do you plan around your vacations? Um, so what I've been doing is I've been posting it each Sunday. So some weeks I'll I'll record like two or three, okay. and some weeks I'll record none. Um, and like I always try to have at least like a backlog of a few so that if, if people cancel or if something comes up, like I can still keep up with every Sunday, you <laughs> know, don't worry, don't worry. You're good. You're good. Um, but, uh, yeah, like that's, that's been working well. I've been, yeah, I've been trying to, to do it each Sunday. 
Yeah, I think I think the the once a week is probably a standard. Once you get to two a week, that's a little bit aggressive. That's pretty ambitious for somebody that has a full time job and a girlfriend. Uh, after a full time job and a girlfriend, I don't know how you have time for anything else. To be honest. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so okay, so the topic of goal setting. I know I had a couple of questions on the list. I think one of them was around what is kind of the right amount of personal goals to have at a time without it getting, I guess, too overwhelming or I don't know. And then maybe the other one was like, what percentage should you aim to uh, complete? Like what percentage of your goals should you aim to complete? I can't, were those the two? Uh, it's been, it's been, it's been some time. Okay, and my okay. memory is very bad, by the way. <laughs> those, those two are, are on the top of my mind. So maybe, maybe we could talk about those first. I'm curious, like, do you, do you set, like personal goals, like do you do New Year's resolutions? Like how do you approach goal setting? So it's interesting because there are a couple of different ways that you can goal set. I think the most common way is to just January 1st, write down all the things that you want to accomplish in the year. Yeah. But any anyone that, that has gone to the gym between January and about, I want to say mid-February, mid-March, knows that there's a lot of good intentions but uh there's a certain point in the year where people just stop going so from an effectiveness perspective i think the best way to set goals obviously is to use that smart methodology the s-m-a-r-t yes the specific measurable attainable relevant and time bound um but to also figure out what your long-term goal is and then just keep taking a step back until you get to something that's actionable this week. So that's, that's kind of the way that I approach goal setting. And that's from, um, I read this book called the one thing. And essentially the summary of the book is that you should only focus on one thing in a given moment that'll yield the greatest possible returns. So from a work perspective, there is one task, um, that you could do such that all other tasks are easier or no longer necessary but it also applies to your personal life, right? Like there's, what's your girlfriend's name? Uh, Gab. Well, Gabriella, but she goes by Gab. Gab. So when, when you get home uh, pre-COVID from work, there is one thing that you could do that is better than anything else that you could do when you get home, such that every interaction that you have with Gab for the rest of the night is made better because of that one thing. Right. Maybe so I try to apply that when I set my goals as well. What's, the, yeah. what's that one thing that's going to get me closest to what I'm trying to get to? Cool. Yeah, no, I haven't, I haven't read that book, but I've, I've heard very good things. So, okay. So you, you mentioned, so you, you actually do that. Do you, do you like write it down? What's like, what are some things you've experimented in the past? Cause like, I know in the past I've had like a whiteboard in my room where I've written down like monthly goals and stuff like that. I, I don't currently do that. Um, I came across a cool kind of annual life reflection uh, document uh, a couple years ago. So I've done that two years in a row now, and that's been, that's been kind of cool. Um, but personally, like I've experimented with a few different things. Like sometimes I, I'm like very on top of writing down goals. Sometimes I'm not. So I'm curious, like what you played around with, what you like best. Oh, I feel like I've tried every possible goal setting method possible it's so i started with this idea that i was just gonna uh reflect and find everything that i didn't like about myself and just try to fix it all at once and as you can probably imagine <laughs> i wasn't able to fix anything uh, or improve anything i should say so um really applying this like you've heard like this 80 20 rule right yeah where like 80 percent of results come from 20 percent of your efforts yeah so rather than try to um, go to the gym and eat healthy and get a good night's sleep and drink enough water and make sure that you're, I don't know, you're spending time with Gab in like a very intentional way where you're not looking at your phones. You're like, you yeah. put your phone away. And there are a million things that you could do to make your life better and to be a, in quotations, better person. But it's about picking, I want to say like one to three things and just fo focusing on those three first. So for me, um, I want to intermittent fast. So I focus on stop, uh, stopping myself from eating past 8 PM. 
I focus on getting um, at least eight hours of sleep. And then I focus on intentionally exercising every day. So uh, aside from the walking or uh, I guess like climbing stairs to go to the fridge, which is typically my exercise, like make, like setting time aside to go outside and I don't know, play basketball, ride my bike, go for a run, something where, where it's a commitment to do that rather than just like an incidental exercise. Makes sense. What, what's your, what have you experimented with in the past? Like what's, what's the thing that worked best for you so far? Huh? Um, good question. I think definitely writing things down helps. Um, I've used different variations of things where pretty much I just kind of, if my goal is go to the gym or if my goal is to get eight hours of sleep, I literally just kind of each day check off yes or no. Like, did I do it that day? Um, and that kind of keeps it top of mind versus forgetting about it. So that's been helpful. And um, like telling, telling other people about it, like having a conversation with like you about it adds like a little bit of an ac- accountability so that can't let me down, man. Come on. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, so that's what I've done. What's, uh, what's kind of top of mind for you right now in terms of habits that you're trying to build? Um, w- like one, one that I've been working on, trying to work on for a long time is to like put on a little bit more like muscle mass. Um, I've always been like a pretty slim, slim guy. So I've been trying to like put on like 10 pounds of muscle for a long time with like mm-hmm. very little success. It's interesting. I think, I think the thing that, that we all get wrong with goal setting is we think that if we set a goal and then we lose our commitment to it for a little bit of time, right? If for a week you don't, you don't do your yes, no tracking, yeah. then you kind of just throw it out the window, right? You say like, oh, I, I fell off. That's it. It's, it's over. And so we kind of throw out the baby with the bathwater. But what I found is the time period that we look at is too small. So if you look at like a single month, that's too small of a time period because maybe in a one month, a week of the month, you didn't track properly. But maybe a more appropriate time period is to look at a year or look at six months or look at three months, whatever, whatever it is, a little bit of a broader time period because that's where you'll start to see uh, movement towards your goal. Because maybe from January uh, to March, you had a 60% success rate of tracking, right? And the 60% tracking is kind of like a separate metric that did you actually do it or not? It's just like, did I even track my stuff? But then the next three months you have a 70% and 80 and so on. And so like goal setting in and of itself is almost a goal (laughs) is to track. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So I've been, yeah, it's cool. You say that I've been trying to view it more that way and view it more as like these goals are more so like habits I'm trying to build. So like, for instance, for me, if the goal is to put on 10 pounds of muscle mass, what I need, the habit I need to do is like maybe track my calories or eat a caloric surplus or something like that. And that's the habit that I need to build. And um, to your point around like just tracking it is kind of like a habit. So like one of the things I track is like, did I use the tracker? So like, that's like an easy one. That's like, it's kind of like a reward for myself to like, just even like open up the app or whatever and like put down that like uh and and look at the other things so that's something i did recently that helped i think a, a large part of it is also setting yourself up for success in making sure that you have the tools to approach that goal and so like what i mean by that is um there is an app in particular that i use for intermittent fasting it's called zero fast I'm dropping a lot of names. You'd think I'm getting paid for this, but <laughs> sponsor the podcast, uh, Peter Atia. Um, but it sends you a push notification at the time where you say you want to start fasting. Cool. And it makes it just really easy because in a, in a day you're doing a million things. You don't have time to necessarily be watching the clock for that moment. So it's just saying Boop, time to fast, just press start fast and that's it. You're good to go. So, you mentioned two of your goals were intermittent fasting and sleeping eight hours a day. So when do those become like, when do you move on to new goals? Like, 
um, let's say your goal is to do it like X number of days in, in the month or whatever it is. Like, how do you decide when you feel like it's a habit and I don't need to have it anymore as a goal? Mm -hmm. It's about, and this goes back to kind of the reason why you don't take on a million different goals at once yeah. is um, discipline is an exhaustible resource. And, you know, even thinking about something where uh, if you get in, you're more likely to get into an argument with someone at the end of the day than at the beginning of the day. Because if you work in, let's say, customer service, you're, you're taking crap from people all day long and you're using emotional energy, right? To appropriately navigate those conversations. And so at the end of the day, you have a little bit less energy to go through the proper channels and uh, be positive. And so it's the same thing with goals uh, that you have is if you're still putting forth a lot of effort to stay disciplined with those goals, then you're probably not ready to move on because you haven't increased the amount of bandwidth you have to challenge yourself more. And so what, ha what will happen is you'll, you'll add something and then everything will collapse. So I guess like how, how uh, specific are you? I'm just curious, like, do you, like, are you to the point where you're like, okay, once I hit, you know, like 80 plus percent of the days I am succeeding at intermittent fasting and, 80 plus percent of the days I'm um, sleeping for more than eight, eight hours, then I can remove those and I can s swap in other goals in my top three or something like that. Like, are you getting to that level of detail or how are you thinking about it? So I'm not getting to that level of detail because I think putting a number on it's kind of arbitrary, right? I think 75% to 85% is effectively the same outcome. Right. Um, I really believe it's, it's, a quantitative or a qualitative feeling. It's not, okay. it's not measure. That part is not measurable. It's just, if, if you sleep at 10, 10 PM every single night, eventually you stop having to force yourself to go to bed because you just, your circadian rhythm kind of uh, shifts so that you become uh, more tired around that time. Right. And so once it starts being um, a huge effort or undertaking, that's when, that's the signal to you that you're ready to start doing something else because it's, it's now a habit and it's now kind of automatic for you. Right. Okay. Yeah. One, one thing I, I heard, I think recently that I liked was something along the lines of like, it's something becomes a habit when it's, it becomes harder not to do it than to do it. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. So like if you're trying to build a habit of doing some sort of exercise every day and it's a pain, when it gets to the point where it's actually like more painful for you to like not do the exercise because you feel guilty about it, then you've like built the habit. That's a, that's a great way to look at it. Yeah. So maybe, maybe I'll use that as kind of a guide. Um, what, what do you struggle with most around goal setting or like what, I don't know, what, what questions do you still have around like what's effective or what's not? I don't know. I think, I think the hardest thing for me to remind myself of, is that it's not something that you can really mess up. And I'm kind of stealing that, that thought from uh, somebody. So a personal trainer I follow on Instagram, his name is Jordan Syatt. And he has one message that uh, supersedes all other me messages for his clients and for everybody that follows him, which is you can't fuck this up. You can't fuck your weight loss up. You can't ruin your, your, your improvements with exercise the only way that you can ruin this is if you quit. And so I think that's the part that I struggle with most is going back to not tracking for a week saying, well, I'm not tracking for a week. So why should I, why should I track it? There's no point in picking, picking it back up. Cause there's a gap in the data. Right. It's like, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Like it's better to have 10 data points than five data points, even though I could have had 15 data points. Right. Um, the, the question I have for you is like, how do you integrate your goals with other people's goals? So it could be um, people in your family, your friends, uh, Gab, or people that you work with. How do you, how do you align your goals with other people um, or deal with a misalignment between goals? Hmm. Good question. Uh, on, on like the alignment piece, I've done things with friends where, um, 
either we have the same goal, like we're going to the gym together, for instance, or we each have a certain goal, like one of us wants to go to the gym, one of us wants to read a certain book by the end of the month, and there's like penalties, like we each of us has to pay each other like 50 bucks or something if we don't hit our goal. So we've done that. Uh, in terms of misalignment, are you saying, would that be like an example of like, I have a goal that I want to do something, but it's it's gonna like maybe put strain on a relationship or something like that. Yeah, like let's say you wanted you decided today that you wanted to climb Mount Everest next year. Yeah, yeah. And that requires a lot of training and preparation. Yeah. And Gab is like, you know what, I Adam, I don't I don't think that's a good idea. Hmm. Interesting. With those, I feel like I try to get better at just having the conversation with the person who it's gonna. Um, who it's going to be misaligned with maybe because I feel like I, I try to avoid those like uncomfortable conversations, but just having them and seeing like what the other person says. I don't know. I think generally when someone's significant other tells them not to do something, you just don't, it's yeah. just easier not to. Yeah. I guess it depends like how strongly do you feel about it versus them? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know. That's a, that's a tough one. I, I don't think that's, come up that that frequently for me i'd say where like i had something i was really passionate about um where it would have like where other people i guess wouldn't have been happy with it um mm -hmm. i guess luckily it doesn't come to mind that that's happened too frequently has it for you um uh, or do you have one in mind no there, there isn't one in particular i was just curious yeah. i know that um this typically happens most with I guess like shareholders and CEOs. I don't know why that specifically popped into my head, that question, but where you have, you both want the company to succeed, but the, the me measure of success is different to the two people. I see. I see. Got it. I wanted to ask you a question as well around um, when the last time, when was the last time you spoke to a friend about setting goals and what their goals were? Uh, I mean, we're kind of having the conversation right now. Before today, before today. <laughs> um, I mean, I have one good friend from work who we talk, we talk about goals fairly frequently. Uh, we don't have a habit around it. That could be cool. Just to mm -hmm. like actually set up time with him or, or someone like once a month or like an agreed upon time to kind of check in on goals as like a, as a means of accountability. We've kind of done it ad hoc here and there mm. when one of us reaches out to the each other but so anyways to answer your question more directly the last time would probably be like a couple months ago maybe okay yeah the reason why i'm asking is because i've noticed at least with with my friend group my family you know the people that i'm closest with that it's not necessarily taboo to talk about but i think everybody's a little embarrassed or shy to to talk about what their goals are and what they're striving for. And I would imagine it's partially because you don't want people to know that you failed if you end up failing. Um, but also I think there's, there's a degree of you're worried that you're going to be judged for wanting certain things. So I'm curious to know your thoughts on that and why we don't have these conversations more frequently. Why aren't we more open with the people closest to us about what we're trying to accomplish? I think, I think you hit it on the head, like probably a fear of, of people judging is a big one. Maybe another one that you didn't mention, probably smaller, but maybe a fear of like, you don't want to come across as bragging. Mm. Like if you have really ambitious goals and making people feel bad if they don't have as ambitious goals. Uh, I think, I think those are the main ones that come to mind for me. Yeah. I, I, I think what this kind of gets at is, the the need for people or i guess starting with you and i but for people in general to maybe be open with their own goals and what they're trying to accomplish and just be supportive of what people are people are trying to do like as an example i have um, a couple of friends that you know with covid have all, all of a sudden have some time on their hands because they were in school and so now they're not they're not in school anymore and so they have accidentally fallen into a really great habit of working out every single day and exercising every single day. So 
that's that's a, a type of thing where maybe they didn't set the goal initially, but it became something that they're striving towards. And naturally, you could you could make fun of them. You could say, oh, you know, oh, all of a sudden you guys are are athletes now, huh? But you could you should really go the other direction, I guess, which is got to support your friends and support their goals because God knows it's hard enough to accomplish these things on our own. We're gonna need some help. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, definitely for me, like accountability and and talking to people has been super helpful. No doubt. Um, question for you around your thoughts on what percentage of your goals you should aim to hit or achieve. Any thoughts? That's a yeah, it's a good question. I think. Again, there is, I don't think there's a right number. I think that you probably shouldn't be getting an A grade on your, on your uh, goals. Because you should be hitting every single one. If you're hitting every single one, then you're just not aiming high enough. Yeah. And if you are not hitting any of them, then you're aiming too high. So I would say there's probably a good combination. Like I think ultimately, if we go back to that SMART framework, if it's attainable, which is the A in SMART, then that's something that, you should be able to hit, I guess, two thirds of the time. So I would say probably around there, like two thirds of, of your goals, you should be able to hit relatively consistent, consistently. But then there's also like multiple types of goals. There are goals where you're changing a habit and you're going to do something hopefully for the rest of your life. And then there are certain goals where it's, it's a, a binary accomplishment. Like once you hit it, that's it, you've done it, right? Like getting that promotion versus being vegan right i hope nobody becomes vegan but that's just a, an example I'm, I'm sorry to say i actually am you're no way <laughs> yeah, i swear to god oh my goodness <laughs> oh I, I i'm not sorry for what i said <laughs> i know i don't i don't blame you okay but see being <laughs> vegan you're, yeah. you're you're planning on doing it for the rest of your life i would imagine i mean we'll see as of now uh i don't have any plans not to but you never know. How can you be vegan? You didn't mention it once this entire conversation. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Trying, I'm just to, trying to bust the stereotypes, you know? <laughs> well, you're, do, you're doing... I was hesitant doing... to even say it when you <laughs> made that joke because I don't want to be one of those people. How, can I ask you how you became vegan? Like, what was the, the determining factor for you? Um, I, was, I was on this, like, self-improvement kind of... I was like really into self-improvement at the time. And I think where I first saw it was like, I was looking up like some, I was reading some list on medium, like 50 ways to better yourself. And one of them was like, go vegetarian or vegan or try experiment with that. And then I think I saw a Netflix documentary around like some of the health benefits. So I ended up just trying it for like a week or something like that. And then I don't know. I kind of, I thought it was okay. Like, and then I kind of slowly transitioned over like half a year or something like that. Um, but that was kind of how I think I first got exposed to it. Exposed yeah, just so to funny. It. Yeah. I don't that, know. It, it's funny. Well, as your friend, yeah. In your quest for self-improvement, I support your veganism. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I'm sorry I added you as a vegan. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. Um, but yeah. Okay. I'm trying, I'm trying to think what else. So you, you, maybe any other, any other books or, or things you came across that have been helpful. You mentioned the one thing I'm going to, I'm going to read that cause I've, it's been on my list for a while. Any others? Um, just looking at my bookcase here. And when I say bookcase, like it's a very <laughs> liberal application to the term bookcase. It's essentially a pile of books on a, I honestly, I think I, I just, I subscribe to the, the idea that you should just read what interests you and try yeah. to read a diverse, um, I guess, array of books. Like you should be reading books on different topics. I, I read a book. So my cousin recommended um, a book to me, which was essentially talking about what if, what if history, we got history wrong. What if we're all very spiritual and there, and magic is, is something that is not kind of a farce, but, um, something that was real. And so like the, the, the biblical tales of, 
these prophets doing crazy, crazy things. What if that actually happened? Because they were able to tap into a kind of energy that we are no longer able to. And so that is not something that I, that, that I've ever believed. I don't think I, I still don't really believe it, but um, I guess it's always good to read something that ch- challenges your, your opinions a little bit. Yeah. Hey, if it interests you and I agree, like reading stuff, it's good to, yeah, I think you said it well, like it's good to read stuff sometimes that, that you don't agree with. And Hey, like I'm, I'm of the belief that like any, anything is possible, probably unlikely, but you never know. <laughs> do you have any, uh, do you have any book recommendations for me? Uh, ah, see, it's not so easy when you're yeah, on the no, spot. It's, it's not easy. I, I, I think you answered it well, like depends on your personal interest. Um, I've tried to keep a habit of, I have a Google doc where I just write down the list of books I've read just in case people are interested in. So if you want message me after, I'll send it to you. Mm-hmm. And I, I bold the ones that I personally liked, but the caveat is like mine and your interest might be different. Um, and I also find maybe it's just for me, but I feel like whether or not I like a book is often based on like what my mood was at like the time I was reading it. Like, was I having like, was my mood like really good that week or not? Like, Mm -hmm. I feel like that is influencing like my view on the book more than maybe I even realize. Um, Cause sometimes I'm, I'm reading or listening to an audio book and I feel like if like my mood's not great or I'm not in a great headspace, like I'm, I'm not fully tuning in or something like that. Yeah. I, have you heard of Goodreads? Like yeah. It's a website. Yeah. Okay. Do you use it at all? Uh, I've used it a bit. So you're probably getting at like why the Google Doc maybe and not Goodreads or no? Oh, I just thought like okay. how, how you use them in tandem because I'm sure like the Google Doc is good to just be able to send to people quickly um, and to bold. I, to be honest with you, I haven't used Goodreads a lot. So I, I can't compare the... Uh, the benefits that you would get. I was just curious. Yeah. Yeah. I, I use, I use Goodreads to see what the rating of a book is before I start mm. it. Um, and typically if it's like not, unless I'm super interested in, in what the book is, if it's not like four out of five or better, I kind of just dismiss it. Gotcha. Um, but I can't remember why I use a Google doc instead of, cause you can track in Goodreads what you've read. Right. There was a reason, but I can't remember why. Maybe it's just yeah. easier to disseminate that information. But I think maybe maybe it was just that. Like it's yeah. easier to send somebody this doc than it is to tell them to visit your profile on this website. Yeah. And then maybe they need to make a profile on their own. I'm not sure. Yeah. Something uh, that just came to mind for me in terms of books that I recommend. Yeah. Um, one of them is in relation to our conversation around goals and one of them is not. Okay. So the one that is not is called uh, When Breath Becomes Air. And that is that is a perspective shifting book if I've ever read one, because the premise of the book is a, it's an autobiography about uh, one of the top neurosurgeons in the U S and he talks about um, his life up to the point where he learns that he has terminal cancer and that his, his dream job is something that he's not going to be able to get the, the family life that he aspired to have is something he's not going to get. And it's about him coming to terms with these things um, and how these things kind of impacted everyone around him. And so that was really, that was, I think so it made me take a step back because I think a lot of times, especially with COVID you sink into each day and you get so lost in the, in the weeds uh, that you don't see the forest through the trees. Yeah. Um, I, I read that book a couple of years ago. I really liked it. Yeah. I, um, um, I'm not afraid to say that I cried at the end. Yeah. Same, same. Oh man, it was, it was rough. Uh, the second, the second book is called principles by Ray Dalio. Um, and so he's one of the most successful wealth managers, um, in history. And he talks about one of the things he talks about. The first part is his own autobiography, but it's called principles because he talks about creating, uh, what he calls machines that output results. And so if the results are things that you're, that you don't like, or they're not optimal, then there's probably a problem with the machine. And so I think when you're moving towards goals to attain them, in a way you got to build your own machines and keep tweaking them until you get the results that you're looking for. Yeah. Um, yeah, ones that are coming to mind for me. Um, 
one related to the comment you said of, I think you said something around people don't always set like ambitious enough goals. Um, there was a book called the 10 X rule by Grant Cardone. Um, he's like he's a, a real sales, estate guy. He's a real estate sales guy. Um, I read it a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago. And uh, I remember just like getting so hyped from that book. Um, yeah, it just got me like really fired up. Um, and I think, I think I've, I've heard him on, I've listened to, I watched one of his videos on YouTube recently and I thought he was like a little bit more obnoxious. So maybe my views have kind of changed. I don't know, but I, that book, it was, it was sort of around this concept of you should be setting goals that are like 10 times as ambitious, um, stuff like that. And I, yeah, I just thought it was really motivating. He, he has, I definitely see the obnoxious side of him. Uh, one of the cool things that, that I learned from him just from watching these, these random videos that you're on social media and you just get somewhere that you had no intention of going, but he was talking about how he evaluates the value of properties that he's looking to invest in potentially. And he, and he was talking about how, you know, if you're buying a house, the obvious thing to do is to look at the bathroom, look at the bedroom, uh, check the appliances, make sure they don't need to be updated. But what a lot of people don't do is they don't look in the, at the area. They don't look at the Starbucks. They don't look at the, you know, if you're going to rent the house out, they don't look at um, the school nearby. So they, they almost look too closely at, at uh, the thing that they're evaluating and they don't see the bigger picture. Hmm. So I thought that was, that was a pretty, a pretty interesting insight or tidbit uh, that I picked up from Grant Cardone. 10x sales guy <laughs> cool yeah i'll keep that in mind when i eventually look to buy um a bit off topic but i can't, i want to ask you because we're on the topic now and uh you're in the hunt right now any like what what would your what would your tips be or things that you think like aren't well known when you're like that you've come across if any when when you're looking to buy your first home like that's that's a good piece of advice is like zoom out look at like where is it located like what might be the value of that home i don't know in 10 years or something like that but any any other come to mind yeah i mean it was easier before covid uh to do this one in particular but uh typically you're if you're using a real estate agent they might have to go to sec a security or the concierge or go to a lockbox to get the key to the apartment yeah uh, so anytime somebody's walking through the lobby i always kind of chat them up ask them, you know, how long have you been living here? Uh, what are your, what are your impressions of the place? And if they say anything that isn't negative, I'll just say, what's the worst part about living here? Cool. And I find that's a pretty good, it's a pretty good way to understand what's going on in the building. Um, and then the other thing that I really learned was you don't know what you want until you understand what you don't want. And so at the start of my search, I probably would get a, um, an email from my real estate agent with 20 properties. And I would say, I like 18 of these. And as I started going to these places, I started to notice the things that I would have seen in the pictures or in the details if I knew what I was looking for. And so certain areas are just quiet and, you know, maybe not for a 20 something year old, maybe it's more for a 50 something year old, uh, but the apartment looks nice. So it's about getting to know the areas. Um, and for me, setting foot in the apartment is the easiest way to s visualize if I can live there or not. If you walk in and, and you don't get the, yeah, I like this place. I would live here. I don't know if that's the right place for you. Yeah. So that, that goes against what early at the beginning, you said, just, just see one place or something. Don't, mm -hmm. don't, don't do what I did, but I, I think you're right. Like, I feel like you do have to see some places. It makes sense what you're saying, like to to really get a feel for what you like and what you don't like. Mm -hmm. I, I, th I think so. Uh, referencing another book, uh, yeah. Blink by Malcolm Gladwell. He talks about how um, your intuition or your gut feeling is actually a really powerful tool and he calls it thin slicing. So in certain situations, walking down a street in the middle of the night, a dark street, and you see somebody walking towards you, right? You make a quick evaluation of, that situation. Um, and so there are definitely times where you need to thin slice things. And I think the first step you take into an apartment is a great way to do that. 
Uh, but then there are times to be more thoughtful, like with, uh, with some goal setting. Yeah. Uh, on that theme, uh, thinking fast and slow. Have you heard of that book? Uh, Daniel Kahneman. Yeah. Have you read that one? Uh, I haven't read it in about five years. I want to say. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's a long one. I can't remember if, it, if I finished it, but it's, it's on the theme of what you're talking about around, um, like gut feel, like what sort of things should you should rely on your gut versus which ones you should like think more about, I guess. It's right. It's like the two, I think he describes it as like the two systems. Yeah. Like you have like a system that immediately judges something. And then you have a second system that, um, I guess like the first system is your reptilian brain. But once you let it kind of the information marinate, that's when you start to reevaluate things. You might see things that you might've missed. Yes. I couldn't remember what it's called, but I think you're right. System one and system two, I think is what he calls it. And system one is pretty much your gut. And system two is you reflect more on it. Yeah. Daniel Kahneman. Pretty sure he won like a Nobel prize. Yeah. I'm, I'm 90% sure. Yeah. I think he did. Wonder if it was for that book. Probably not. I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, what else? Any, anything else you wanted to talk about or thought we might talk about? Uh, I, I want to know um, how your life has changed both from a professional and a personal uh aspect due to COVID uh, like what's been the hardest thing about it what's been maybe an unexpected benefit yeah I'd say overall the biggest benefit I think I think stress levels have gone down um, and don't really miss commuting that much <laughs> um, yeah. and my girlfriend and I we've been going on like an hour walk every day, which has just been nice. Sometimes we'll just tune into our own audiobooks or podcasts, but it's nice. Um, yeah, biggest change, like biggest downsides have been just like not seeing friends at work and socializing less. less. Luckily, like I have quite a few friends in the area where I live that I that I'm like seeing from a distance, like when I saw you. Mm. Um, but that's that's probably the biggest downside um but it's i i had thought about like remote work in the past um because you know like if if you're willing to work remotely it opens up like a lot more potential opportunities um for work so i had thought about it in the past but i didn't know how i would like it so this is this has kind of helped me understand like if i would like it the big difference though is I mean, my girlfriend's a teacher. She's never going to be like long-term remote. So right. the difference would be if I, if I have a remote job post COVID, it's a different experience when you're working home alone versus like having someone around. Um, so yeah, I'm just trying to think out loud that that's probably still like the biggest kind of consideration. And that's why I think even in the future, if I was to work remotely, I'd probably try to work from like, coffee shops or like we work we work type spaces or something yeah, yeah. What, what about you i think this has been a real proof of concepts for working from home because prior to covid uh my company instituted uh, a one day a week work from home policy or i guess a remote work policy where you could on a wednesday if you were so inclined stay home and work from home and i think there was a lot of hesitation around giving people um, that type of autonomy because I think there were very strongly held beliefs which were probably fortified over time from just working in an office that certain interactions um, need to be in person for them to be productive. And I think probably outside of sales or outside of a situation where you're trying to influence somebody, I think that's largely not true. Anytime you, you're trying to influence, I think it's always better to be in person. But other than that, I think a lot of employers will be a lot more open to, uh, to working remotely. Yeah, I agree. I think for me, as it stands now, I probably would want to work from home. Maybe if I had the option, maybe like a couple days a week and yeah. go in three days a week, something like that. What, what about you? 
Yeah, I definitely don't want to work from home a hundred percent of the time. I think it's, that could be pretty lonely. Um, but I also, I'm not sure what your commute is, but I have about uh, an hour 10 each way. I'm, so, a, I'm around there now as well. Yeah. You, you get through a lot of books, audiobooks, TV and movies, uh, when you have that much time of just going back and forth. So I think that's been a gift is getting those two hours back. But I think what the cost of that is, is that the line between work and home life has really blurred. And what I mean by that is there's no five o'clock or five fifteen or five thirty um, kind of lull that you fall into when you're at work, where you say, "Okay, it's time to go." And then, you know, for in my case, I would leave my laptop. I would lock up my laptop. You have your whole leaving ritual. You organize your desk, maybe get your jacket, your bag, and you get out. And then from that point on, you're, you know, your atom of, you know, that Gab knows and that your family knows. You're not, you're not uh, employed, Adam, right? So I think that now there's really no, no ritual of ending work. Your laptop and your, your desk setup, however you set it up so you can work most efficiently, is always there. And it's a lot harder to, to disconnect and to uh, be the other version of you, I find. Do, do people tend to, like where you work, do people tend to book pa- meetings past five now? It's not common. It's not common practice. Okay. Okay. But for every meeting, there is admin work that you need to do. Yes. There's preparation you need to have. Yeah. So you can easily stay past five. Fair. I've, I've tried to have the habit of at five o'clock, my laptop, I shut it and just put it in the closet and it doesn't open up before nine. You put it in the closet. Yeah. Why do you put it in the closet? Just like, no, I don't want to see it. Oh, okay. Cause it'll trigger a I don't desire to just check one thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I moved like the, ma- I turned off notifications for mail and, and we use Google Hangouts instead of like Slack, but those are off just so like, I just am not tempted. Um, so that's been helpful, but I've heard a lot of people say that's been a challenge. Um, like, have you, have you done stuff like that or do you, do you leave your laptop open or? Uh, I'm pretty bad. <laughs> if, if the goal is to disconnect, I've been pretty bad with it. My laptop sits right, <laughs> right where it is right now, which is right where it is when I work. Um, I get email, Slack, everything to my phone. <laughs> uh, notifications are on. So uh, I, I, I'm, in, I'm in a customer support role. So at the end of the day, it makes me better at my job. Right. Because if somebody's on the West Coast, they're three hours behind. So it's six o'clock for us right now, but it's three o'clock for them. They're still right. in the middle of their work day. So right. I can support them and do my job better. But then I also am kind of on call for all hours. Right. Hmm. The yeah, closet's it's- an interesting one, though. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. It's it, it almost sounds like... Uh, like it becomes a transformer at night and you need to, to lock it away. So it doesn't come get you. I mean, we don't, I don't have a desk in the, in the apartment. So it's not like I have a desk drawer to put it in. Right. So I have like a backpack in the, in the closet that I just, I put it in there. Um, out of sight, out of mind. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think on the goal setting piece. So the, the last thing maybe I'll ask you, you talked about the one thing and I, I do, well, I haven't read it. I do think the concept of, you know, focusing on one goal at a time makes sense. Like, I believe like multitasking doesn't really work. Um, and personally, like I've found that when I've had multiple goals, like yes, in the past, sometimes I've been able to achieve multiple, but typically like my energy seems to go to one of them. So like you mentioned, you have three right now. I can't remember the last one, but around intermittent fasting, eight hours, like, have you thought about just doing one at a time until it's a habit or I guess three is working well for you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think, uh, I, I've never really tried one Yeah, because I'm, I'm the type of person that likes to try to do as much as possible. Yeah. But I think why the three that I've chosen work together is that they're not dependent on each other and they can happen at different times of the day. So I can exercise 
um, like, like certain things are at set times. My intermittent fasting I know is at eight o'clock. Um, so that's been to a certain extent automated, uh, going to sleep. I know that, um, okay. Another great book that you have to read. This is a book that you actually have to read. Um, it's called why we sleep. Uh, it's by Matthew Walker. I haven't read it, but I've heard about it. When you, when you read about what happens to your body, when you get less than seven hours of sleep, uh, you will want like a nine hour sleep, sleep opportunity. Um, so what, what does it recommend? Seven to, I know I've heard seven to nine is recommended. Yeah. So, um, seven is the absolute minimum. Okay. Uh, but in addition to getting seven hours, the thing that almost seems to be more important is getting the right amount of sleep opportunity, which is in the bed, distractions away, um, actively trying to sleep. Okay. So that's like eight or nine hours of trying to do that with like a caveat that if you're just not falling asleep, get out of bed and go, go do something because that's an unproductive kind of thing to do and it'll hurt your it. sleep in the long run. So I, I got a, I got a puppy, uh, a few days ago so that's oh. really that really screwed my sleep because now <laughs> now i got alarms in the middle of the night to let let the, the dog out but what a cute way to have your dna slowly turn on you and try to kill you <laughs> <laughs> uh but yes i'm gonna read that book and then maybe maybe after that i'm just gonna the, the dog is gonna have to figure out how to hold its bladder longer i don't know you're gonna have to potty train this dog it'll it'll get there like on the toilet, not even <laughs> going outside. That'll, that'll be a bit tough. Uh, what, what kind of dog is it? It's a, a Westie Poo. A Westie Poo. I hadn't heard of it before. Here, let me see. Let me see if I can get him. What's his name? This isn't going to, this isn't going to sound good on the, on the, on the podcast. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is okay. This is like an audio adventure. His name of is, the apartment. is Charlie. Charlie. Oh. He's just chilling. Yeah, he's sleeping, so I, oh. I woke him up. But he'll go right back to bed. This is Charlie. Oh, my God. <laughs> All, All right, that is – I know, I know the people that listen to this won't be able to see your dog, but that is a freaking adorable dog. Well, if, if, it's, if it's all right with you, I'll put uh, the video on YouTube too. Yeah. If you, totally if you don't cool care. Yeah. I don't care. Cool. Um, I think it'll, it'll shatter a lot of uh, – people's expectations when they see what I look like when I work <laughs> with this gray hoodie and I mean I'm in like a white undershirt so you you have like a more of a Mark Zuckerberg vibe I got more of I'll like, take it I'll take I, it I was recently hired but a monkey could do my job I think Jack Dorsey wears a lot of sweaters yeah him and I have I respect him a lot the same number in our bank accounts except for a couple of zeros difference <laughs> many zeros <laughs> Anyways, Eddie, we're almost, we're almost at an hour. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate you coming on to, to chat. Like, like I said, I think one of the biggest benefits for me is I think this is just a cool way to kind of have another way, uh, means of kind of accountability around goals and thinking more about it. Um, and I got some good book recos. So I'm going to read the one thing. I'm going to read Why We Sleep. Um, what, what were, you mentioned one or two others. Blink. There was, yeah, Blink by Malcolm Gladwell and yeah. then uh, Principles by Ray Dalio. Cool. Yeah, I read Principles. That, that was good. Um, but yeah, any, anything, anything you want to say in closing or anything, anything else you, I don't know. Yeah, anything else? Yeah, I think that this has been a great learning experience for me uh, to be on the other side of a podcast. As you mentioned, I have my work podcast that I write and host. So uh, this is this has helped me better understand how I can be uh, a better host because you're a great host, and uh, it just I'm, I'm very appreciative for for the invitation and I enjoyed speaking with you, Adam. Thanks. Yeah, I thought I thought you did an awesome job in uh, the first episode you did. Um, I liked the lightning round you did, which was really cool. Uh, it was it was casual, and uh, I definitely I definitely learned from from you as well. And I'm I'm gonna think about maybe doing that at, at work too. I if, encourage if, you to set that goal. <laughs> I have to think about if it's too much to manage or cause yeah, like that, that I just don't want to, to overdo it. Um, but I might, I might float the idea by someone else at work and see if they want to take it on. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really cool if you've got the time, but 
you got to have the the bandwidth, right? Yeah. Anyways, right. Eddie, it was a it was a pleasure. Thanks again. And uh, you're welcome on anytime for, oh, for thanks, other, man. other. If you ever get a job at at my company, I will interview you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll start my own podcast. So I can start interviewing people outside of my office uh, that are also interesting, but don't work with me. Well, I'll come on. I'll come on that one. <laughs> so I'll start it just for you. Sounds good. Well, good luck with the rest of the, with the uh, apartment hunt. And uh, good we'll, luck, we'll good luck with Charlie and Gab. Thank you. <laughs> Talk soon. Talk soon. Bye.